we're going to continue in our series, The Jesus I Never Knew. Uh, this is a uh, series we're doing for the next uh, several months, trying to unpack some things about Jesus that some, some of us may not know. Some of us may uh, have some questions about or may even be thinking a little bit uh, that Jesus uh, may not be associated with some of these type of things. In uh, 21 verse 33, we read uh, a, a story, a parable that Jesus uh, uses, and Jesus talks in parables often uh, for a number of reasons. Sometimes he talks in parables because uh, the eternal, timeless word of Jesus, of God, if you will, uh, is often hard for us to get on the first try. Right? And how many of us learn better through stories anyway, man? Y'all acting brand new this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of y'all learned everything you know about love and soap operas through stories. I say that, right? I mean, some of y'all favorite records are about people who tell stories, right? And, and, and so we can talk nice philosophy and nice grandiose uh, uh, words, but the things you remember the most are often told through stories. And it's often even the case that Jesus often told uh, uh, these stories, I think, because, uh, you know, have you ever heard something and then you don't realize that he's talking about you till later on? <laughs> we kind of take the edge off, right? It's like, you know, uh, uh, you know, he didn't usually tell everybody straight up that they was just, you know, full of sin and, you you know, separated from God. He would tell a story and you're like, wow, oh, that's a deep story. And then you start walking around, like, wait, he's he talking about me. <laughs> this is one of these kind of stories. Uh, Matthew chapter 21 verse 33 Jesus says uh, listen to another parable there was a landowner who planted a vineyard put a fence around it dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower then he leased it to his tenants and went to another country when the harvest time had come he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce but the tenants seized his slaves and beat one killed another and stoned another Mean, mean tenants. Praise God. Again, he sent other slaves more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Verse 42 is the primary kind of piece that I'm going to have us focus in pretty heavily on. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the primary keystone, the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So we're going to speak for a few moments from the topic, uh, Jesus knows rejection. Jesus and rejection. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God. Bless the rest of us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. Since your anointing that makes teaching and preaching easy, and let it rest upon me and even hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Uh, how many of you know that rejection can lead sometimes to direction? Amen. And I find it a very fascinating thing when you talk about Jesus because... Jesus seems to be someone who everyone has sanitized, has removed the scandalous kind of nature of who Jesus represented to the people that Jesus encountered on a regular basis. Be clear that Jesus uh, came to save the world from their sins, 
Now, how many of you know that a lot of folks we want to be sad? <laughs> kind of like us, praise God. I mean, you know, we, we talk a lot about being saved from stuff, but when push comes to shove, we show up on that life, that life uh, line back. And we're like, oh, come back to me next week, because I'm kind of enjoying what I'm in the middle of right now. That Jesus was someone who, in many respects, was not easily embraced by everybody. And we often talk about Jesus today. Oh, Jesus was so loving and he included everybody and Jesus was this and Jesus was that. But understand that Jesus didn't die on the cross because he was so loving. They didn't kill Jesus because he loved everybody. In many respects, the way that Jesus postured himself in the world was in many respects a consistent form or exposure of rejection. That he always found himself moving back and forth between being accepted and being rejected. Mm -hmm. John chapter 1 verse 11, the scripture says that Jesus came to his own and his own people did not receive him. <laughs> Somebody call it rejection. rejection. John chapter 7 verse 5 says that not even his own brothers, his own family believed in him. Somebody say rejection. rejection. Luke verse 4, 24 says that Jesus told them, Truly I say to you, a prophet is without honor or acceptance in his own hometown. Mm -hmm. Somebody call it rejection. rejection. John 15 verse 18 says, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. Somebody call it rejection. Yeah. One of the most painful experiences as a human being many of us will ever endure is being rejected. Quiet as it's kept, a number of us will live a good chunk of our lives in such a way to avoid the vulnerability mm -hmm. yes. that even makes rejection possible. Yes. Some of us will be calculating as much as we can to live in the middle so to not be rejected. Yet when we look at the life of Jesus, I find him having this constant intercession of acceptance and rejection. When he did things that make folks happy, boy, they accepted Jesus. When he fed everybody, oh, Jesus, you the bomb. When Jesus told them that uh, they stuck stick that was like stone them. Push them off the cliff. We can't take this, Jesus. And it makes me wonder, what does it mean for you and I who claim we want to be like Jesus? To be like Jesus. To be like him. Oh, how I want to be like him. So be I don't know that song, guys. <laughs> but don't you know being like Jesus also means that you got to be comfortable being rejected. <laughs> that Jesus was someone who was very familiar with rejection, but Jesus did not allow rejection to detour him from his proper and most highest purpose. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't believe that when Jesus experienced rejection, it in many respects gave him new direction. Or it reaffirmed the direction he was going in. And part of what you and I as people of God, followers of Jesus, people who are attempting to go through this process of sanctification, this process where we are becoming transformed into the image of Christ, is that rejection must be something just like Jesus, the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 53, that he was despised and rejected. He was one who was acquainted. He was familiar with rejection. 
Rejection Jesus had first name basis. And I keep wondering and thinking, what is it about us that makes us respond to rejection with such sharp feelings? Particularly maybe it's because we're thinking of rejection in the wrong way. Could rejection be an opportunity for you and I to gain direction? Now, when I take a look at this, this, this chapter, I, I look at the many ways that Jesus uses rejection as a way to teach and direct folks towards a certain trajectory of their lives. If you take a look at the beginning part of this chapter, you see Jesus is entering the city of Jerusalem and everybody is celebrating him. Everybody is throwing their clothes on the ground. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Oh, you're the great bomb diggity. You're the greatest thing that ever happened to our country and our people. You're coming to bring us victory. Thank God Jesus has shown up. The Messiah is here. And then a few moments later, folks is trying to figure out how to arrest him. <laughs> Jesus enters the temple and the scripture says that he kicks over the tables. Why? Because folks are in the church, in the temple, engaging in behavior. That is not only dishonest, money change, and other kind of things, but the scripture says that they have pushed out all the people who need to be inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Jesus rejects the activity in the temple and teaches a lesson about who needs to be inside and what the church should be doing. Later on in the passage, Jesus is walking in and he sees the fig tree and is not giving up any, any fruit. And Jesus rejects the fig tree. He curses it. And then he teaches the disciples through this act of rejection a lesson about prayer. Later on in the passage, the Pharisees and the religious folk try to come to Jesus with all these questions and, and are trying to treat Jesus into, into answering things that would uh, incite folks. And Jesus rejects their inquiries and proceeds to teach folk a lesson about manipulation. find yourself doing the work of the one that called you. <laughs> and then we get to this story, where Jesus is now engaging with some of these same folk, and he is lifting up a very powerful story about who gets included in the work of God. One of the things that I'm most captivated by in this passage is this idea that God invites all of us to be included in his work. But depending on our behavior and our follow through, if you will, our response to God's uh, act of stewardship that he commissioned upon us, some of us can find ourselves on the outs. What is it that you and I can learn from this story? One of the first things that I find here in this passage is that when, when, the, when, the, when the, the, the husbandman or the landowner is, is actually engaging his, his, his tenants and his slaves and, and all these different kinds of activities, you find that there is violence at work in this story. In response to accountability and even eventually rejection. The first thing that I want to lift up when we think about rejection, how you and I respond to rejection is, can we overcome the human temptation to respond to rejection with violence? Can you and I 
Learn to respond to rejection without violence. Tomorrow will be the first Monday of the month of October, and every first Monday it is domestic violence awareness across the country. And I continue to be very captivated by this very important issue in our community because I realize that domestic violence is an issue that is often not talked about enough unless something big happens in the news. Then everybody gets on a domestic violence trip. Mm -hmm. But I am very much aware that just like in this story, much of the responses to rejection or those things that drive people to anger are often grounded in greed, power, and maybe another one I'll call fear. And as people of God, I want to raise a question to you and I is, how can we be people who are committed to living in interpersonal relationships with one another in such a way where we are never given over to the impulses of violence. Obviously in this story, these individuals were greedy. One of them was talking about, well, you know, uh, we can just take whatever is being brought to us by this son. We can, you know, pocket all of this for ourselves. Some of them may have been fearful. Well, you know, we don't want to necessarily have to deal with the consequences of, of the person who's in charge of the landowner because obviously we have to take care of our business. Either way, they were given into acts of violence. And my brother and my sister, even when you feel rejected, sometimes, if not all the time, you have to begin to not make that an occasion for you to act out on that which is rejecting you. But you must learn to look inside and deal with it in ways that are nonviolent. We were with some of the young people from Ferguson this week, and we were doing a talk at one of the colleges, and one of the young students stood up and asked us, why is it that every time you are being met with the no from the criminal justice system in Ferguson and St. Louis, why is it you all continue to respond nonviolently? Man, if someone was responding violently to me, I would respond with violence back to them. <laughs> it's very fascinating. We all begin to have a conversation about why nonviolence, not just as a tactic, but as a way of life, is so important for we who seek justice and certainly for we, the followers of Jesus. Because when you act out violently, you are denying not only the humanity of the other person, but you are also diminishing your own humanity. Mm -hmm. When you react with violence, you are, in many respects, exacerbating a problem and not resolving the problem. Yeah. When you react with violence, you are basically saying that I do not have the trust that God is going to work this out on my behalf. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to take this matter into my own hands. Now, many of you heard me say, you know, I really, really struggle and want to be a person of nonviolence. Just don't push me. Praise God. <laughs> I think if we all keep it real, that's a lot of our testimonies, right? Yeah. And I'm not just going to allow somebody to just, you know, run roughshod over me, et cetera, et cetera. But I want to submit to you that this is a hard truth for we, the followers of Jesus. Jesus said that we who live by the sword will die by the sword. Mm -hmm. Jesus talks about how you and I are to engage with one another, not with acts of malice and hatred, but with acts of love, mercy, and forgiveness. And I think one of the first truths in this passage is, even when the rejection lights a fuse inside of us, no matter what side it comes from, you and I must learn to live and react without violence. The second thing that I find in this passage as it relates to how Jesus uses it and, and employs rejection as a new direction is Jesus often allows rejection to come into our lives. Why? So you and I can be open to new people and opportunities. Quiet as it's kept, God's plan for us does not always die with our plan. Yeah. And how many of you know that some of us are holding on to things so tight that God can't usually uh, 
son and then you got it and then he was like <laughs> but 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 you but you wouldn't give it up. You wouldn't give it up until it gave you up. And how many of you know sometimes there's things that God would have for us in our lives, but because we have other placeholders there, God's best cannot get into the space where God would want it to be. Be open to new people and opportunities in the middle of our rejection, our moments of rejection, I think is an important lesson and thing for us to consider. Because Jesus in this story begins to reject the privileged folks of the day. And theologically, folks have called this the great reversal. Where those people who were often thinking they were in, Jesus would flip the script and turn it upside down and they would find themselves on the outside. And this is one instance where the gospel can become bad news for some folk. Because if you are one of these folk of privilege and one of these folk who always know that you are the one who's on the inside and you're from your place of inside didness, <laughs> your place of privilege and you're easily able to, to discern who's out, I think the gospel becomes bad news for you. Because in this story, Jesus says, particularly talking to the Pharisees and religious leaders, I'm going to take the kingdom away from you and give it to some folk who are really going to produce something of substance. And I just want to believe that one of the truths that being lifted up in this particular passage is that God wants you and I, when we experience rejection, to be open to new ideas and opportunities. Things that may actually be needing to replace that which has walked away from you. Who are the folks in your life that need replacing as they reject you? What are the career opportunities in your life that may need a new twist as you have been rejected? What are the moments in your life where you can actually say, Lord, this is an opportunity for me to hit a reset button and give you some opportunity to reorder my steps? Rejection can often be direction in that it helps you to consider new alternatives that you otherwise would have never considered. And then the last thing that the scripture says is that you and I must be ready for God to move marvelously. I love this part of the passage where it says that the stone the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and it is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Could it be that some of these acts of rejection are nothing but an opportunity for God to act in our lives? I know none of us like to be rejected. I don't like to be rejected. I'm not one who walks around you know, trying to encourage you to just, you know, look for opportunities to be rejected. I'm telling you that when rejection comes, and it will come, tell your neighbor it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> Imagine that that is an opportunity for God to act marvelously in your life. Psalm 94 verse 14 says that the Lord will not forsake his people, nor will he abandon his heritage. Psalms 27 and 10 says when my mother and my father forsake me, then the Lord will take me in. 1 Peter 2, 4 says, When you come to him, a living stone may have been rejected by men, but in the sight of God you are chosen and precious. That when you are experiencing rejection, my brother, my sister, it is an opportunity for you to create space for God to move. Because when God starts moving, 
way. I believe that God is trying to push some of us to, to not be so preoccupied with feeding into whatever image or whatever crowd that's out there and be willing to say, God, that if I'm going to follow your ways, I will be someone who will not be directed or redirected in a negative way by rejection. But if I want to know you, and I want to know you in the power of your resurrection and in the fellowship of your suffering and being made like you, even unto death, I must realize that part of that process is learning to endure rejection. And I must be someone who will square my shoulders and straighten up my back and realize that if you have rejected me, then I know I serve a God who will accept me even in my lowest moment and even in my lowest point and give me a new why some of us need some rejection financially. Some of us we depend too much on our name and on our on our own our own uh, intellect and our own expertise. But how many of you know there's a situation that's going to come in your life where none of that is going to be able to keep you? None of that is going to be able to hold you up? None of that is going to be able to make or make you get to the place that you want to keep? And it is in those moments you better be able to look to the hills. Rejection. Jesus was acquainted with it. Jesus was familiar with it. Jesus did not allow rejection to move him off his course. As a matter of fact, Jesus, as the great Jedi master he is, <laughs> could use rejection to a Jedi mind trick on folk and make folk learn things through rejection. Rejection, not for the sake of being radical, but rejection for the sake of being faithful to the call of God. This is what it means to be faithful. Not even when folks are walking away from me. I will stay the course. Rejection is that. Stay with me, everybody.